thing is just to open up your bulletin. Here I have, what, five weeks left, and I'm like, starting to confuse our office administrator like crazy, because every week we're going back and forth with them. Um, singing the Lord's Prayer, and then we put a song in. So what I didn't realize was that we're missing a song. So after the Lord's Prayer, it should say, Contemplation Song, It Is Well With My Soul. Okay? So we'll have that song in there. Don't want you to be too surprised by that. The next thing is that Rachel has an announcement. Good morning. This is just a save the date. We will be having a gathering June 26th after the service, because we're only at one service by then, that will be our farewell to the Frasers. Uh, we will have a sign-up sheet shortly. We're hoping to get that next week per Paula. Um, and card and envelope will be coming around again next week, and then a couple weeks after. So we can try and hit everybody. So save the date. June 26th.
since I forgot them before, this is perfect timing, right? So here's Kokora. You have seen her in worship many times, but uh, lately, nap schedules and all of that work better with first service for them. And so Cora and Elizabeth Wilson was baptized this morning in our congregation. And um, so we just, I wanted to share that with you and just let you know that we have yet another sister in Christ in the community of God. So exciting. When you see Lisa and Jeff, please congratulate them and just know that they have chosen this to be their home community right now. So, amen? Amen. 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 Let us move on, please, to our prayer. I mean, to the choir. I love that. God, you are a God who comes to us wherever we are, and yet you call us to go, to go be there for into all of the places in your world that are hurting, the places that are full of joy, but also sorrow and pain and loneliness. You call us to go to the places where we will find great happiness and purpose. There is no place 
that you do not call us to go. And so God, assure us that you will go with us everywhere, that you are there before we ever arrive, that you still remain when we have left. And each step of the way that you surround us, you are in us and with us. Oh God, we pray for all of those who need your healing this week. We give you thanks that you put certain names on our hearts, like Allison brought up this morning with Janet Leonard, who has another chemo appointment this week. Be with Janet this week. Be with all of our friends, our family, those we know well and those that we don't. Be with them as they go through the difficult things of life. Be with us as we celebrate and as we try to take hold of that which gives us the most joy and satisfaction in our lives. Help us to know that these are your good gifts as well. Help us to lean on you, to be thankful to you, and to spread that kind of joy with others. Oh God, be our God. But perhaps make us into your people as you were always our God. And help us to believe it so that we may know it in our bones and in the air we breathe. We pray all of these things in your name together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue next song.
Please rise for the reading of the gospel. So the scripture this morning is from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them, but when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, he goes, and to another come, and he comes, and to my slave do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. This is the word of life. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jerry. Next you. So, I see this story as really nothing new. Jesus told lots of stories about folks who said things like, oh, I don't need anyone or anything to help me. I have no need of God at all. I'm good, just the way I am. And if you think he didn't say that, then you just need to go look up that story of the, the unjust judge. And that's exactly what he said. I have no need of God or anybody. That's exactly it. So it's a classic character in life. It is. We all know people like this. And I suspect that probably many of us have also been there ourselves as well, right? Well, I have this Facebook friend. And he is a devout atheist. He posts memes almost every day and other mean things about Christians. And I have to admit that sometimes I agree with them, right? Of course. But he never makes a rude comment about anything I post, which I appreciate very much. Even if it happens, happens to be like a picture from church or anything, he never ever says anything mean about that. Sometimes he even likes it. So, you know, we can at least talk about this. But people like him really intrigue me. They really intrigue me because I imagine them in their lives and, and I think about how easy it is to think that you don't need God. Huh? It's so easy to go through life thinking that everything you do is because of the way you hold up yourself, right? How you, that whole thing about bootstraps, right? Or how you work so hard to get there that everything you did is all because of yourself. It's really easy. So it depends only on yourself and your family, and then to look down on others who talk all funny about their faith or as if their life depended on it. Until it doesn't work so well anymore. Right? Until the diagnosis comes that no one can fix. Or until a relationship of yours is in shambles and it can only be fixed by something outside and so, you can fill in the blank, I'm sure. And so we have the centurion. I think he looks something like this, that you see up here. Uh, give or take a few shiny things. Uh, I'm sure it's about like that. He's fancy. He's got the duds. He has more than what most people around him have. And he's scary. You know, headdresses make you look taller for a reason. Bigger and taller, all of that. You're going to be bigger than the other people around you. A little bit scary. But 
He's also, he has many opportunities to be kind, um, to be protective, to gain people's trust. He has authority. He can make things happen. Just like it said in the scripture, he says, go, and everyone around him gets up and they go. This guy is a Roman soldier who happens to like Jesus, which is kind of fun. He's attracted to Judaism for its ethical teaching. It's one God. This is different. This isn't what he's used to, and it's kind of fun. There's a, a bunch of folks like him. It turns out he's just one of many, and um, he happens to be in Capernaum, which Capernaum is a city where we say that's one of Jesus' hometowns. Okay? So he's probably seen and heard a lot. A soldier's job partly is to be where the stuff is going on. So it's very likely he's seen many things that are going on with Jesus. He's been around, he's heard it, he's seen it, he's smelt it, he's all of that kind of things. And so he's interested in it. And all of this time, somehow he's grown a faith. And so when his slave gets sick, he knows just where to turn. And now, I'm going to address this. This is me getting on my soapbox, completely aside um, from the sermon. Today's scripture is one of those very, very awkward stories where sometimes people will use this scripture to condone slavery. Okay? You need to know that. This is the kind of stuff that happens. Um, so it's a little tricky to preach, especially if you're going to, um, especially if you don't want to talk about that at all. Okay? So if we were all in a room around tables and we were doing a Bible study together, this is the kind of stuff that we would be learning. It says in there that the, the slave was valuable to him, okay? Which is kind of a weird thing. Of course he's valuable, right? Mm -hmm. But because later we have something else. It says this about the man. The man had friends. Well, it turns out back then, they never, ever, 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 ever said a man had friends. So as we actually say that statement about the man, the centurion, we know that he had other relationships that were important to him. And so then when you connect those verbs together, they're pretty sure that that part, that conjugation of the word value on there actually meant that he valued the relationship he had with the slave. This is kind of cool. But even so, even if we want to act like that's just, oh, this little thing, and oh, well, he values you well, and this is why people condone slavery using this. Oh, but if you treat them well, it's okay. It's not okay. It's absolutely not okay. And in Jesus' circle, it was not okay to have slaves. There is a gross power differential between one person and the other, and it was not okay. This might be one of the reasons why the centurion does not want Jesus to come to his house. Does that make sense? Don't see what I have. Maybe I can just pretend it's someone at home who needs to be healed, right? No, 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 no. Don't come to my house. He might just feel absolutely unworthy of that because he owns a slave. It was not okay in Jesus' circles. It was frowned upon. And later, so remember, this is, they're talking about a story that was in Jesus' time which is still Jewish time, right? When it was written, the story, they have now begun already creating Christian churches and communities like that. They were kicking people out of the Christian church if you owned a slave. It was this big. This big. So that's really important to know. Now we're going to get back to the sermon. Okay? So you've heard people say before that they like Jesus, but they don't like the church. Heard that? This is a little bit like the centurion. He's a little bit like that. The centurion, um, he's very much like that. He likes what they do together. He, he likes this thing. He likes what Jesus talks about. He says, eat together. Um, take care of one another. Love one another as I have loved you. This is what he likes. But he also likes some of the other things. And that's what he sees. Perhaps he was outside of their places of worship sometimes. Um, so maybe he likes the sound of what they're saying, the words they're saying, maybe even likes the incense. So he's kind of sort of gotten involved on the fringes, but there's something that keeps him from plunging all the way into the membership, and wisely so. Remember, to be a, a Jewish man, what did you have to do? You had to get circumcised as an adult. So you know, it's, it's kind of understandable that maybe he wouldn't want to take the plunge. And if he's not going to join the church, Perhaps he also doesn't feel like he has to follow all of their traditions and all of their rules either. So, 
Remember that little piece from the soapbox. So when the book of Luke was written, right, it was years later, and it had already begun to have these Christian communities where there were some pretty strict rules, and one of them was you absolutely didn't own slaves. So can you imagine when they write this story into the Bible, can you imagine people who knew the story might say, oh, did you hear about the time? The time when Jesus actually did something for a Gentile. And they go, oh, really? And they said, oh, but even worse, it was a Roman soldier. <gasps> oh, and then somebody says, oh, it was worse than that. He owned a slave. And everybody, oh, but it's amazing, right? And so they listen, and they hear the story, and it becomes a story that reminds them about what Jesus does. So let's not forget, of course, that Jesus did heal the slave. That's a good thing, right? My hope, of course, it doesn't say anything about this, but my hope is that the slave then gets up and lives life the way somebody does who's had a brush with death, maybe a little more adventure, uh, perhaps some edginess, perhaps is willing to challenge the status quo a bit here and there, or just simply not being afraid to say what matters most. But the story isn't about the slave. The story is about that's the important part. I had a professor at my alma mater who was a physicist. Now, I never took physics, <laughs> but I took other things with him. And while you might not know his name, um, he's written a bunch of books and edited, ed edited books um, on physics and the intersection of physics and faith. And um, I once spent eight hours a day for five days studying Genesis and creation stories with him at camp. Well, this man had a wife named Sandy, and together, these two people were some of the most hospitable people I have ever known. And these two faithful people taught me much about faith. They taught me about clout and how you use what you can for the good of others. They taught me about servanthood no matter where you find yourself and also financial responsibility. So when I looked at these people, I thought, wow, you have it all. You're amazing. Dr. Carlson is his name. He was someone who I expected to not need God. I expected him to be one of those physicists who said, you know, this is all it hopes. But he didn't, and it's amazing. But part of the reason I expected that is because he had a great job he was teaching, he loved to teach. Um, he was tall and good looking. Um, even at 75, he's still just an amazing looking man. Clearly, not a lot going for him. He was a physicist for heaven's sakes, and most of the other people who were his colleagues were arguing with him about these things. He appeared to have just kind of everything he wanted. So maybe not everything, but everything he wanted. He had a beautiful family, absolutely beautiful family. He had a home with a pool, who he let all of us use pretty much any time we wanted. He didn't have a headdress like the centurion, but he had a lab coat that went with him. And when I knew him, he was mostly in his late 60s and then early 70s. And even then, he was in such good shape. He was blessed with good health. He was hiking, he was biking, and teaching. And so it kind of amazed me that this lead them to a deeper faith and lead them to broader questions than they could ever have before. It worked for a lot of us. That week of study is why you hear me mention the creation stories so often because of all the study I did with him. Dr. Carlson and the centurion know this to be true, that anything they can do, God can do better. Anything they can do, God can do better. And they know this too, that life is better because of church and because of community. Life is better because of the teachings of Jesus and faith in God. It really makes all the difference when life gets hard. Dr. Carlson's life hasn't been easy, even though I thought it was. Um, they moved to Colorado maybe five years ago, maybe more, to help care for their grandchildren when their mom, who is their daughter, of course, suddenly died of a brain aneurysm after running a marathon. She had been the picture of health. This family is not immune to hardship and difficulty like any of us. Just like we hear about from the centurion, Dr. Carlson's faith 
has absolutely propelled him forward in his life. His faith heals him just because it is at the center of his life. And he knows that Jesus is not only the source of life, but Jesus leads him to greater discoveries and better truths than anything he could ever do on his own. And so I want to ask you a bunch of questions as we move on. I hope you can find yourself somewhere in here. Is there a place in your life where you think that you can do it all alone? Or I'm going to change a word. Is there a place in your life where you think you have to do it all alone? I think the centurion says to us, anything you can do alone, if you do it with God, it will be better. Is there an issue that, that keeps popping up where perhaps just even some prayer, any prayer, or more prayer, might actually bring about some change if you could let God do a little work there. Just something. Now, some of you here are like the centurion. You say, go! And everyone around you just picks up and goes. Right? That's not all of us. In fact, that's not many of us. But some of you have that experience. So what if you prayed about these people where you say go and they, they get up and go? What if you prayed about those people or that skill that you have or, or wherever it is where you have a lot of control and say so? What if you prayed about that more and asked God to change it even more for the better? To make it even better than it's already? What would happen? Or do you have a place of despair in your life? Or you are just afraid of letting God in. Maybe you are like the centurion in that particular way, where you have followed Jesus, where you have gotten involved, where you have gotten acquainted with the, the community, but you've kept your distance because there is something lurking behind, something maybe behind closed doors that is shameful that you don't want Jesus or any of his people to see. This is, the, this is the good news. When this happens, when the centurion comes to Jesus, Jesus doesn't embarrass the centurion. He doesn't take his finger and point at him and point at his sin. He doesn't make the guy unpack everything and, and talk about what he's hiding at home. He doesn't talk about his unworthiness or make him go into detail. It's not what happens. Jesus instead acknowledges the faith that the centurion has. This faith that does not come easy. It does not come easy. Jesus simply recognizes the truth that the centurion has enough faith to believe that Jesus can do what he is not able to do. And Jesus simply treats him as a child of God and sends him on his way like the rest of us. And this is the good news of life. Amen? Amen. This good news is found in the Word of God. This good news is found as we seek out life. And this good news is found in a loaf of bread that Jesus lifted at one point and looked around and he said, this is my body that is broken for you. It is good news that Jesus says to us, this is my body which is broken for you. Take it and eat it in remembrance of me. And it's even better news when Jesus takes the cup and he says, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Indeed, for everyone who has ever walked the face of the earth, whoever will walk the face of the earth, it is for you, for the forgiveness of sin. This is good news, and it is offered to all of us. Without Christ, we are just asked to come to have faith that it is for us. Would you pray with me? Oh God, be in this bread. Be in this cup. 
Remind us that you are here, that you go with us, that you go before us, that you love us no matter what we are hiding, but you also offer to heal us of any shame that we might carry and bring us the life abundance. Amen. Amen. Sandy and Eric, would you please come? This table is for everyone. There is no one who has ever turned away from God who has ever turned away from this table. Please come when you're ready.
it. <laughs> so, um, Connie told me that if she didn't have that baby by Friday, they were going to induce her on Tuesday. Do you have that appointment? Is it made? It's Tuesday. So it's Tuesday. Call one more time. Okay. So, be praying for Connie <laughs> and their whole family, whole family too. Um, Bless me, not you. So, um, hopefully, I have great news for you sometime this week, and if not this week, on Sunday. So, anyway, um, would you stand and pray? They give you the benediction that we say in days of baptism. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen? Amen. Amen. We are called to walk by faith, to step out in faith, and so we're going to sing that. I hope that you have a wonderful Memorial Day. For those of you who are remembering loved ones and remembering others, may you do honor and glory to them. Amen. Thank you. 